under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning. It's Wednesday, July 26, 2017. It's 10 a.m. This is a scheduled workshop. Uh, there are two items we did have. Typically, we do not have the public comments during workshops. So I, I do apologize to is it Lauren Paulson. Um, again, it's typically on the workshops, it's just dedicated to those workshops, and this has been our our policy for some time, Lauren. So. Okay, and I think you had had a handout. Well, an earlier handout, I think, at a prior meeting also. Okay, thank you. So, uh, again, it's 10 to my left. We have county council just walked in. Uh, Commissioner Gold, myself, Commissioner Huxley. <clears throat> I don't see Commissioner Boyce here. And then we have the uh, Commissioner Clerk, John Jesuit. The first item, and it's going to be a presentation, and there was a, or is, a separate uh, document on that little in intro uh, is going to be the Wild Rivers Coast Alliance presentation. So, we have. Let me see. Are you going to are you going to be putting on a PowerPoint or anything, or just talking? There's going to be a PowerPoint with two videos and then talking. Okay. Have you arranged, John? Has has that been arranged with you? Yeah. Okay. So you've got. Oh. Charles. So do you want to go on over to the podium and and please introduce yourself for the record? Okay, my name is Jim Seeley. I'm executive director of the Wild Rivers Coast Alliance, which is a philanthropic organization affiliated with Bandon Dunes Golf Resort. And I'll be joined today by Miles Phillips from Oregon State University and Dave Lacey from Oregon Coast Visitors Association. And with that, I'll do a, a bit of a lead in here. Um, Wild Rivers Coast Alliance was formed uh, by Mr. Kaiser, who's the owner of Bandon Dunes. He's a very philanthropic individual. And uh, uh, he, he formed this alliance, and upon forming it, he uh, uh, went to the governor's office and gave the governor a, uh, let's see, how does this thing work? He gave the governor a, a courtesy uh, a description of what it was he was doing. And uh, he asked the governor if, and it was Governor Kitzhaber at the time, and he asked the governor if he had any suggestions, and the governor said, well, I don't see anything here on uh, the visitation and tourism. He said, I strongly suggest that you add that because that is one of the, the things most needed in rural Oregon to help reinvigorate the economy with the demise of the, of the forest and the fishing industries, the extraction industries. And so uh, one of the first missions that I got from Mike was, uh, was to put in a, a, a part on what we call uh, outdoor recreation and tourism. Uh, but it fits with our uh, major uh, initiative, which, which is to support economic development and ecological enhancement through fostering local, sustainable businesses and nonprofits. And then uh, we've learned to increase positive local benefits of visitors by expanding year-round visitor and tourism experiences on the South Coast, aimed at increasing visitor spend. And that's the purpose of what we're doing. And uh, just a little bit of a story. <clears throat> uh, I got involved with Wild, Wild Rivers Coast Alliance because I had the good fortune to work with Mr. Kaiser on launching Bandon Dunes Golf Resort. And I kind of like to say that I spent 13 years helping him make money. And I've had the pleasure of spending the last five and a half years helping him give it away. <laughs> <laughs> and our area of of uh, granting uh, includes 10 watersheds from the Coquille watershed down to the California border, the Winchuck watershed. So a very large part of it is in Curry County. And to give you kind of a description of why uh, we've learned at the suggestion of the governor that, that tourism is so important is are some pretty broad statistics. but. Uh, direct travel spending in Oregon, there are some numbers up there you can all see, 11.3 billion in 2016. It's hard to know what that means to an individual, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and uh, importantly, it's increased 4.3% from 2015, and that year it increased 4% from the year prior. 
and then there are a, a large number of overnight visitors traveling to Oregon in 2000, 2015. The effect on the South Coast economy, that includes both Coos and Curry County and parts of Douglas County, 17% of the economy is directly impacted. It's, it's directly 17% of the economy in that region. And then if you add in the indirect uh, spend from people who make their living uh, in, uh, in travel and tourism, it adds up to 25%. So it's a huge input to the, to the uh, economic health of the region. For some reason or other, there we go. That's a weird mouse from what I hear. Yeah, I can tell that. You know, I like to refer to myself as the generalist in our organization. I have a couple of staffers uh, who are not with me today who are the technicians, but fortunately, it turns out there are a number of technicians in the audience. So uh, here, here are some, some statistics that really sang a song to me when I began to really look into this. And this is uh, the Coosan County average spend per person that visits the Oregon coast. And you'll notice that in Coos and Curry County, the spend is significantly less than the spend per visitor in the Oregon coast region and, and the state average. And, you know, I kind of have learned to look upon that as an opportunity indicator <coughs> that uh, if done well, if, if, uh, if tourism and outdoor recreation are done really well, we can in incent people to want to spend more of their leisure time money here. But then there's another one that really hits home to me, and we will figure this out. And this is the high economic contribution of visitor spending per capita in Coos and Curry County. How many residents of Coos and Curry County do we have in this room? Okay, so this, this is impacting you folks. In Oregon, the spend per, per, per traveler is a little over 2000 in Curry County, it's over $4,500 per citizen. So that means that the spend from, from travelers in Curry County is more than twice as, as big as the spend in the rest of Oregon per inhabitant. So I think these two statistics kind of make a case for why it's so important here. And uh, so what do we refer to when we talk about the South, South Coast region? And here's a map, and it is typically shows the counties, uh, and Coos Bay, Curry County, Josephine, uh, and Douglas County. And uh, our particular region, WRCA, is concentrated in Coos and Curry County, where we do most of our granting work. But we've learned in talking about tourism and outdoor recreation this is what the traveler sees. The traveler doesn't see county demarcations. What they see is the Oregon Coastal Range and how they get to our region. And the way to get to our region, if you don't take into account the airport in Coos Bend North Bay, which accounts for a very small percent of the visitation to our area, you see that there are really limited numbers of way in here. Uh, Route 38 over to Reedsport from the I-5 corridor, Route 42, through Myrtle Point, Coquille, and then into Bandon, which is the southern part of that little X there. We didn't put the city of Bandon on this map. And then uh, uh, I-99 from the I-5 down to Crescent City, and then where the major visitation comes from is north through Brookings or south through Reedsport to get into our region. So to us, it became very apparent that this is re really a regional uh, effort that we need to be promoting. And while, while we see that the individual cities uh, make their own effort to promote tourism, uh, we think that our effort in, in this is to try to create a bigger pie by encouraging more people to want to come to the South Coast region and then the individual pockets of, of uh, businesses and communities that depend upon uh, visitation uh, have a bigger piece of the pie to go after. And so our concentration has been predominantly regional in nature. And uh, when we talk to people about, we like to use the term visitation, we find that there's a lot of built-in 
push back against the concept of tourism because some people think you know they they moved here to get away from lots of people but travel and outdoor recreation involve a lot more than just tourists they involve friends and family and they involve bus business visitors and the more that there is to see and appreciate here the more you can entice a, 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 a business visitor to want to spend longer come early stay late enjoy what's here that he can't find from wherever he's coming and the same with same with friends and families that uh, some friends and families stay in a home some stay in hotels but the more we can offer in this region to cause them to want to spend more time as long as they're welcomed by the family <laughs> then then we can really help pick up that spend per visitor that we've been talking about and so that really has been the thrust of what we're trying to do and there are a lot of things happening right now in our region that I wanted to quickly bring you update on first of all the Wild Rivers Coast Rural Tourism Studio was completed last year and the, 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 the workforces the work groups that came out of that are still very actively engaged in promoting outdoor recreation on the Wild Rivers Coast region and then Coos County Tourism Work Group has just kicked off. It's kind of an evolution from that failed uh, uh, transient lodging tax that Coos County tried to put through, and I understand Curry's, Curry County tried a similar move, failed. and the taxpayers voted it down. And we recognize, and part of the reason why it's important for Ban and Dunes to be involved, of all the uh, lodging entities in unincorporated Coos County, uh, Ban and Dune is by far the largest. Uh, it, 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 it minimizes in comparison all the other lodging efforts and so our owner the very philanthropic Mike Kaiser came to us and said is there some way that we can cause the county to not feel like they have to go back after that transient lodging tax again because they were gearing up to go back and put it in for another 10% and they had figured out why it got voted down that the fact that it was a presidential election that year the ability to get it back on the ballot and have it passed was really very good. And uh, so we did some mathematics, and, and the law requires that there be a 70-30 split on a TLT. It has to be 70% uh, tourism promotion and 30% to the general fund. And we did some calculations and said if we could bring Band and Dunes on at, 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 and, and have it be the one paying the replacement for the TLT and reversed the uh, the payout 70% to the general fund and 30% to tourism promotion that with a 6% uh, add-on to our uh, guests we could make get the same amount of money for Curry County that they would have gotten with that 10% applying to every uh, lodging association in the county and so we did that through a memorandum of agreement which is a contract between the county and Bannon Dunes and it went into effect January 1st of this year and we're very involved in that tourism work group being put together now and of significance on that while it's a Curry County initiative they recognize the county does and the people involved in this the regional nature of the tourism promotion challenge and so while the while the uh, exec uh, while the board of directors are Coos County citizens we have ex officio members two of them are here today Miles Phillips from Oregon State and Dave Lacey who lives in Curry County and we have two more ex officio positions that are open uh, for that board of directors one from Curry County and one from Douglas County and we're still searching for suggestions from folks like you on who that representative should be that second representative from Curry County and they'll meet with us in all of our uh, board meetings have strong voice in the say they just don't have a vote on how the money's used and then uh, Oregon Coast Visitors Association South Coast Destination Coordinator uh, it came out as a result of the increase in the statewide TLT of 0.8% done by Travel Oregon. And uh, that is what gave rise to Dave Lacey now being the South Coast representative of the uh, Oregon Coast Visitors Association. And he's been serving in that position now for what, Dave? Uh, One, sir? Year. One year. And then at this same time, Oregon State University, and you'll hear from Miles and telling you more about why they're doing it, but, but we learned in the process that a lot of land-grant colleges are, 
are putting tourism into their curriculum. And so they recruited uh, Miles Phillips to come be that person for uh, Oregon State University, and he's, he's stationed down here on the South Coast region, so he's directly involved with all these folks. And then the South Coast Regional Rural Tourism Studio is one that was done for the region from Reedsport to Bandon. If you'll remember, the, the, the people from the north all come from Reedsport to get here. Mm -hmm. And so Reedsport's part of that regional tourism studio that's underway right now. It's been operating now for about a year. And then here's the regional scope of what, uh, what WRCA is involved in. And we kind of listed it from the south going to the north, and those are the cities, Harbor, Brookings, Gold Beach, Agnes, Langloy, Port Orford, Bandon, Powers, Myrtle Point, Coquille, Coos Bay, North Bend, Lakeside, and Reesport. And we intentionally left the counties out because we think in tourism promotion and outdoor recreation promotion, the people that don't live here really don't care about county boundaries. They care about the people they're going to see, the sites they're going to see, and uh, Dave Lacey will be talking more about that. <coughs> <clears throat> and uh, to, uh, to let the people involved in the Rural Tourism Studio tell you more about what was going on with that, a little, a little video for you. It's about 10 minutes. region is that we embrace who we are and I think that's what unifies us. Once the timber and fishing industries collapsed, it took us a long time to get back on our feet. The idea that once these jobs left, they weren't going to get other family wage that's, jobs. That's our system. And it crippled us. That's our system. Isn't it? Things were getting really dire. So we just thought that this was an opportunity to maybe look at that public land a little differently and how it could bring more dollars into our region. The Wild Rivers Coast is so unique because there are more wild and scenic rivers here than anywhere else in the lower 48 states. The scenic beauty is just amazing. So many different places to go from the national forest down to the protected ocean and it's just a really special place. I guess I didn't really know how special it was though until I moved away to Portland and came back and saw all the potential here. We're uncrowded, we're unspoiled, and we're a little difficult to get to, but my God, once you come here, you fall in love. We just thought if we could pull people to come into this well and explore a little farther into our back country, there was a lot of opportunities for them to experience. I think our whole future is at stake here. This area is ready to go, we just need to give it a little kick in the butt. I'm going to be honest, when the Rural Tourism Studio came here, I was skeptical because I didn't see far enough ahead that we actually could collaborate regionally, and I'm pleasantly surprised. It's been amazing. The Rural Tourism Studios was the first time we were able to come together as a region to talk about the future of our economy. If we can have a strong tourism economy in this area, it's going to benefit the whole community. We have to rely on ourselves, and I think through this program, it sort of opened our eyes to what we could do when we work together. Community leaders really focused on three areas. Outdoor recreation, food and agricultural tourism, community relations. In our area, a lot of the food that's grown all gets shipped away. And so now we're realizing that we can capture some of that local food that's grown here. The Fresh and Local Action Team has hosted a series of networking events bringing together the area growers with the area vendors so that we could have more local food available to the visitors to our area. And now we're seeing more local food in our grocery stores, in our restaurants, and we have a new local food co-op. We created a farm trail from Bandon to Port Orford. We did nine U-Pick farms, and it just gained traction, and people loved it. Langlois is less than 500 people. It's very small. 
So we have to bring in tourists. And being on the farm trail, even though it's just beginning, has really helped do that. We really want to make it a destination for anybody. My mom and I began Dragonfly Farm just three years ago. When I found out that I could grow a seed and turn that Oh my gosh, why wouldn't you do this? I just quit my, my day job and I just signed the paper to be an official co-owner of the farm. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life and grow up the community. Out of the Outdoor Recreation Action Team, a series of maps that should places to go recreate are. We know where we're going to send people now and we've got a great map that shows all the best places to go see. For us to get a mapping project done to this extent is pretty impressive. We're patting ourselves on the back. <laughs> I don't know anybody else is, but we're doing it. From that, we decided that there was some places that needed help. So we came up with a mountain bike plan, and we also worked on designating a state scenic bikeway. The outdoor, so looking at how we can make scuba diving better in this area. So we came up with the idea for a scuba fill station. So now people that want to come and dive in this area, they can dive for multiple days. Up again. When I started the Rural Tourism Studio, my business with South Coast Tours was really small. And now we've grown to about five or six guides. And we're doing tours all over from Brookings all the way up to Coos Bay. Overall, tourism is on the rise here. We've had a bang up last two years, and it's like a breath of fresh air down here. My hope for the area is that we still keep that sense of place. Loving a place to death is a big concern that I have, and it's a balance. We're going to promote tourism, but we want to do it in a sustainable way. One of the biggest reasons that this area has been so successful since the tourism studio is the people that are involved. We have a lot of great, motivated, smart people who understand the need to promote tourism in the right way. And it's really all about the people. When you live in a rural community like we do, from Bannon down to Brookings, and you're strapped for cash, relationships are crucial. As a community, I think you need to come together and find out what your mission and goals are collectively. Then you can work into smaller groups knowing that you have the backing of the whole community behind you. As long as everybody's just super excited about it and passionate about what they're doing and they can work together, then anything's possible. Own what you have and don't try to be something that you're not. It's going to be hard. It's going to take a long time. So roll up your sleeves and just dig in with an open mind. With that, I would like to introduce one of the real experts in the group, Miles Phillips. Thank you. I have a couple of farm trail in case anyone wants to have a copy of the farm trail rack card. I can hand out afterwards or pass one around. Sure. And then I did a little piece on a new effort in tourism from OSU Extension when it started last year. So I've been here one year now kind of in response. Actually, there's more. So there's more for anyone else that wants. So what I'd like to do is, is really just let you know about the assistance available from OSU Extension. And Extension, County Extension has always been there to be in the community and help the community with issues that they identify. And this uh, opportunity for new economic development growth through visitor businesses, uh, tourism, outdoor recreation is one that was identified as a need and in, in that way created the opportunity for this position. So I started last fall uh, in this area. I came from doing this work in different coastal communities. I started on the wrong coast, I mean, you know, the east coast and <laughs> went to the third coast, which is the Gulf Coast in Texas. I spent the last 15 years there and finally got to the west coast. And so really, really thrilled. It's fantastic here. People have been fantastic. And the energy here around 
looking at how to um, utilize the forests and the marine resources in combination with the traditional uses, but looking at how to share that story through tourism and visitation is phenomenal here. There's opportunities here now that I don't think, from my understanding, were here just a couple of years ago. And so with that in mind, we um, have put together a program, that the services I offer, based on some of the background I have. A little bit I shared with you, but I was most 15 years in Texas running as the Associate Department Head of Extension for Texas A&M University Extension, working with our wildlife extension, working with our coastal marine uh, folks in Sea Grant, supporting youth programs, uh, tourism, uh, growth, planning, uh, parks, and so on. But that was across 254 counties. So here, it's a little bit, it's still a big area, but it's not the same. So it's nice, get to meet more people repeatedly. I did my master's work in uh, College of Forestry at West Virginia University and kind of looking at same how forest dependent communities can capitalize on on these uh, guest visit you know guest economies and before that I actually was a consulting engineer and in Minnesota and New York and uh, tourism is a lot more fun so I mean that so I wanted a little bit of background um, Mr. Seeley gave some background on numbers, so that I won't spend a lot of time on the economic impact, but from <clears throat> U.S. Travel Association, they have that travel and tourism is over $2 trillion economic nationwide. One out of every nine jobs is in the travel and tourism sector, whether it's restaurants, hotels, lodging, or tours, uh, and or travel. Um, and one thing I find interesting is that without the local tax the federal tax revenue from travelers we'd all have to spend an extra eleven hundred and forty seven dollars if we wanted the same services so th in that way kind of like mr Seeley showed there's individual benefits from this general eco economic activity um repeat we showed these in our 11.3 billion dollars of growth last of uh, uh spending last year um this is a sixth, actually, I think seventh year coming up of growth. So we're in a period of uh, economic growth within the travel and tourism industry. In terms of individual jobs, again, from the Dean Running Study that Travel Oregon does, they list uh, approximately 105,000 jobs in Oregon uh, with a secondary impact, like services that support those, another 54,000 jobs. And just to get a sense that, <clears throat> yes, we know there are a lot of opportunities, great opportunities to get high school or entry level jobs, but there's growth opportunities for careers within this. Uh, and from a quick look of some openings in Oregon, job openings for hotel managers, uh, found that roughly most of those were offering around $100,000 a year. So there are opportunities for good income uh, wages in these professions. Uh, this is just kind of quick quiz what we just heard. I use this, but we know about 105,000 jobs total of all kinds from the managers to the service to accountants to marketing. And what I want to highlight here is just some of the uh, recent successes that uh, I've had a blessing to jump in and, and be a small part of. The <clears throat> city of Gold Beach acting as fiscal agent for this rural tourism studio group was able to successfully get a grant from Travel Oregon to obtain professional photographs, uh, to hire professional photograph photographers so that they could be used in marketing campaigns to highlight the things that the community wants to highlight and bring visitors to those areas with truly professional quality images. So these are early photos. The final drafts aren't in, but I had five photos that were submitted. Uh, photographers just uh, made two trips recently, and we've got some out. For, well, actually, they finished up yesterday, the, the second set of photographers. So there will be hundreds of photos now available to Gold Beach and the in each uh, community or destination management organization that uses that TLT tax to use for free um, in marketing the area. And here's just a few, the scenic bikeway, fishing, local brewery, more biking, mountain biking this time instead of road biking, kayaking activities. And I mean, 
pictures like this, they actually, on this screen, they're not as looking quite as good as they do on a, on a smaller screen. So I <clears throat> wanted to let everyone know there's already been some great success and, and thank Jody Fritz here in Gold Beach for the, the work she did there. My role is helping really to, like Extension in other programs, whether it's with forestry or ag, it's to help bring the most recent information and best practices to people who want to do business, whether it's the community looking at how they expand economic development or whether it's individual businesses that want to know how they can expand their market, their value, their pricing, or landowners, whether they're timber or ranch or, or farmers, how they can capitalize on guest businesses to supplement or take over. So I've worked with a lot of landowners, and that was primarily when I did private landowners in Texas and South Carolina, and helping them uh, make money off this. Some from people who just want to be only a limited in value or in time, they only want to do a little bit and make, you know, five, ten grand for Christmas money, or people that have multi-million dollar businesses off these gas operations. And one of the key things for these landowners uh, to realize is as opposed to traditional uses of land where it's a per acre revenue model. So how many animal, you know, how many cows per acre can you raise? How many uh, board feet of timber can you raise per acre generally? Uh, tourism or guest businesses are not necessarily working on that model. So you have a thousand acre property, your guests may only utilize, you know, 50 acres of that. And for instance, one ranch I worked with, 3,000 acres, they use about 60 acres, make, uh, well, I don't know the actual revenue, but uh, they get 300,000 visitors a year. The only on that 60, 000, 60 acres, the rest of the land is kept totally private for the family and for other business operations. So um, there's opportunities for that when the county thinks about county lands too, there's, there's ways to think about that. Um, I am here to help with business training uh, and with community training and to do applied research. So when there's questions about what will really work, what the market for something is, we can help do that. I can pull in other researchers through the university system other universities and we can help answer questions that maybe need to be answered locally um, and with that work there's been success and so from Texas I have a, a video from some communities of them telling their own story I'd like to show a part of this some others are available I'm gonna have to start it and then fast forward because it's 11 minutes but I just want to highlight one community in particular here if, uh, is my mouse awake? It's just very slow, so you, <laughs> the slower you go, the better. I think it works. There's no hurry in curry. <laughs> I heard that once. <laughs> okay, let's do it this way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over to the computer. <laughs> show the extra five minutes because I can't fast forward it <laughs> but this is about Texas what part of Texas communities all over we were able coast. to restore 18 historic buildings but the, the more issues I saw, are the, the more passionate I became about the value of our native habitat Texas is an increasingly urban state. More than 85% of the state's residents now live in cities. This explains why rural areas are becoming more popular as getaway destinations. In Texas, 19 million urban dwellers are seeking escape and relaxation away from the city. Knowing this helps us understand why nature tourism plays such a significant role in the communities whose success stories you're about to see. These communities recognize the potential of nature tourism and seize the opportunity. As a result, their economies, wildlife, 
and quality of life have improved. With many agricultural operations utilizing nature tourism, the Texas Department of Agriculture estimates the overall economic impact of nature tourism at over $10.9 billion. Nature tourism is a diverse industry that includes activities from hunting and fishing to camping and hiking, mountain swimming, and kayaking. Activities include wildlife viewing, stargazing, and nature photography. The variety of nature tourism activities available in Texas is practically endless. Not every community will follow the same path, but the following stories will give you a glimpse into some of our state's most successful nature tourism enterprises. My predecessor had identified three potential markets for, for Harlingen, and they were hunting and fishing, golf, and birding. So I thought, okay, birding, don't know anything about it, but let's try it out. And uh, after a while, kind of se settled on trying a birding festival. And so the Rio Grande Valley Birding Festival actually immediately became a huge success, in large part, of course, because this area has the birds. We have 510 recorded species of birds just in this little area that's about 250 miles wide, about 60 miles deep. That's a huge, that's more than most entire states have. The number of birders though is huge and they leave behind a million dollars. That's why we've got the business community on our side and that's why the Chamber of Commerce is, is involved and, and the government officials understand the value, both economic and quality of life, of having areas for birders. And birders, of course, include, more and more include the local people. And we've got a lot of people who come from other countries here to go birding, Canada and even overseas. Which, fortunately for us, this is also a super area for nature photography. We have several, several ranches in the area that have designed and implemented um, photo blinds specifically for nature photographers, which they then rent out, so it's another way that they can be making money off of their property. Summer Bird Celebration is an event put together because of the ruby throated hummingbirds. This festival has a million dollar impact on the community. Our budget for this, which is a pretty much a break-even budget, is around thirty-eight to forty thousand. It's kind of unique for a Chamber of Commerce to put on an event where we're going to tell people about preservation and nature tourism. It, was, it, was a, it wasn't hard for us to do, but it was a different twist. Most chambers are interested in economic development, growth, and jobs. So we had to kind of do a dual education process. We had to let our members know that it's important for us to bring birders in our community here's why. And it's important for us to uh, promote tourism, here's why. And then at the same time, we had to tell them, put out your feeders, plant the right plant. Well, I think we taught people that events don't have to be like festivals where you have a tent. We told them that an event could be educational and they can learn something. An experience that involves learning, I think, is what people were after with this uh, topic. You know, come to bird watch in our area and your knowledge of not only hummingbirds, but all birds. We have the celebration of hooping cranes or, and other birds here that our birding center is actually in conjunction with the uh, wastewater treatment plant, and we have the boardwalk out there. And so, you know, it used to be we're going hunting or we're going fishing. <coughs> you know, you went hunting in the winter and fishing in the, in the summer. But this... Uh, the whole thing of, of just enjoying nature, I think, is becoming extremely important. This movement began the way that all real things do, desperation. It began because you had a community whose very existence was threatened, and you had a community of people whose way of life was threatened, where they'd lost half their population, 75% of the tax base, half of Main Street was boarded up, and that was just one community in an Great Plains. You know, we were one of the first places to have the half-cent sales tax and to hire an outside professional to come in and 
help us have a plan to save us and those kind of things. But then every time somebody had an idea, it seemed to be a thing that threatened either our environment or our lifestyle, and people were up in arms. Was it like prisons and, said, and no, incinerators? We're not, we're not going to do those like things. That. Let me just give you some highlights of our program. We have programs that are, are known kind of nationwide, like the Lesser Prairie Chicken Weekends that we do in the spring. For six weeks in the spring, we bring in groups that we take out on lake sites to see what we call the booming. It's actually of the Lesser Prairie Chickens. We bring those folks in every day for six weeks. They come from urban areas. They pay for a weekend stay here, and they go home a convert. That's one of our hallmarks. From that, it goes to, in the summer, we do an adventure series where we bring folks out once a week into nature, also in small groups, but a little bit larger. The Lex sites, we only take eight people. These groups, we bring out groups of about 25, and they get to ride on a wagon, and they go down to the river, and they get to find out how a windmill works and who lives in the windmill pond, and they, they get to uh, actually swim in a slough where they didn't know what a slough was before, and they find out about the six kinds of turtles that live in this world. Those are, are really simple activities based entirely on that natural experience. In a few years' time, we were able to restore 18 historic buildings and have new businesses in those historic buildings and to see 200 new jobs that we developed exclusively through tourism and then 200 new jobs that came to us because when those companies had a chance to base somewhere in the region, they said, this is the community that our employees want to live in because of what they're doing and so then it became 400 new jobs. And we began to see a hotel motel tax that increased by 100% every year for three years. And we began to see a sales tax that we don't have that here, grew but about 20% <laughs> But it's every retail year business and growth. continues to grow about 20% every year, which means that now it's 100% more than it was before. And we were able to see not only were we able to keep those assets that we so badly wanted to hold on to that were so unique for a small town. You know, to, to actually have a first-run theater in a small community like ours. We were able to go to a place with eight world-class restaurants that we get to enjoy 365 days a year, whether we have any guests here or not. And we were able to see more financing for our schools, for our improvements in our infrastructure in our community they didn't impact our everyday life we weren't overrun with strangers and then best of all they spent their money and they went home and we still got to keep all this wonderful stuff so uh, there's just a little bit more that kind of more uh, but i'll pause it there there's more videos if people are interested but wanted to highlight that because uh, it just shows some of the communities we've worked with in the past. Some things transfer, some don't. But the big thing I'll say for me before I introduce Dave uh, Lacey is that Oregon Coast has some phenomenal resources that these areas didn't have. And one example I'll give you, I hosted a group coming to one of the properties that I was working with. And it was a busload of people and a guy got off and looked at me and said, this is one godforsaken place, isn't it? <laughs> and I was like, you know, he's like, I came here because my wife wanted to drag me here. Because <laughs> uh, there's no hills, no water, no uh, no ocean where they were. And uh, Oregon has all of that, plus great people. So I think we're a event. Now, he actually left happy. We found a way to make him happy. He was very happy. But it was because of the guided experience. Um, so with that, I'd like to just say I'm available to help and introduce uh, Dave Lacey with Oregon Coast Visitor Association. Hello, commissioners. Thanks for having us here today to talk about tourism. Um, yeah. So you're Oregon Coast Visitors Association. Good. Yep. And I'm Dave Lacey. I've lived here going on 23 years now, and I've sort of watched this community evolve over many years of uh, living here and playing here and raising my family here. And I think um, one of the 
things I like to talk about with tourism and our visitation, as some of us like to call it, uh, is, is it's not going to completely replace our economy. It's not like visitation is going to replace timber and, and fishing necessarily, but what it does is it diversifies our economy, and I think that's a really good thing. And, and what that lady said um, is, I thought was kind of funny is we get to take advantage of all these tourists coming here, spending their money and helping us develop more infrastructure, and then they go home, and then we have this place to ourselves. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Um, so this is a little bit of background on the Visitors Association. So what we are, I'll, I'll try and go quickly through these boring, boring stuff, but uh, we're a public relations, destination development, promotion, marketing entity. Um, we cover the entire Oregon coast, so 363 miles in all seven counties. Um, we're mutual benefit, so there's some membership-based um, income in our organization and we put out uh, the Oregon Coast Visitor's Guide. That's really sensitive. There we go. So, our board of directors spans the whole Oregon Coast, um, all the different regions. There's three at large folks, regionally diverse. There's some <coughs> motel owners, some restaurant owners, um, um, folks like myself who also operate guide businesses. Um, we also have a strategic advisory board. So this is a Board of Natural Resource Agency heads. So you got Forest Service, BLM, State Parks, Fish and Wildlife, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife for the state. Um, we meet about three times a year to talk about ways that we can share resources to promote visitation, but also keeping in mind that um, stewardship is very important. So instead of sending people um, to the most crowded tide pools, um, we're trying to spread people out into different places because some places up north are getting trampled and um, they have different issues on the north coast than we do down here so there's actually too many people oftentimes mm -hmm. um, so spreading the impact of um, the visitation across a, a broader area to make it uh, more healthy uh, we have membership so a lot of chambers of commerce are members visitor centers in some cases the cities are the um, direct marketing organizations now so they're um, partnering with us as well as lots of tourism businesses um, down here your board members are Gary Milliman from the city of Brookings and um, Nick McNair from Jerry's Jet Boat. So those are the two South Coast positions. Um, so we have a lot of uh, contacts and connections with the different tourism and trade media, and we're very close partners with Travel Oregon. You said it's kind of slow, right? So if you're not familiar with the, how the TLT process works, um, there's a tax of 100 or 1.8% through all RV parks, motels, campgrounds. Um, that goes to the Tourism Commission in Travel Oregon, and then they take that money and spread it out to all seven regions. So there's the, we're the coastal region, so we get um, a certain percentage of all the TLT money. <laughs> Than I was. <laughs> I'm rolling it. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. So, if you want to be a member of ACFA, which is the short way of saying Oregon Coast Visitors Association, um, you get accentuated listings on our website. Um, you also get these hot leads. So, when people come to the Visitors Association, they want to learn more about the Oregon Coast. Um, they give us our email and phone numbers and stuff, and so ACFA will gather all that data and send it out to our members so that we can solicit them um, to take care, advantage of our services. So what is your membership fee? It, it varies depending on your organization. So personally, South Coast Tours, my kayak business, is a member, and it's about $300. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on how many employees you have, um, what type of organization you are, like nonprofits are cheaper. Um, so yeah, you also get 15% off advertising on our website and in our visitor guide. Um, you get it, take advantage of our industry newsletter um, uh, and email um, lists about different industry happenings. And also you get a, a sort of a, a preference when we do fam familiarization tours. And so that's um, when we get travel writers, TV shows, um, things like that, groups like that to come here and help promote the area. All right. So our goal is to increase destination spending on the, on the Oregon coast, and especially so in the shoulder season. So 
when a lot of the kids go back to school, tourism sort of drops. So getting the shoulder season, what we call it, is, is September, October, kind of even into November, uh, March and April. So before the main season kicks off, we want to try and bring more people in those shoulder times. Um, and let's see, we, we really want to partner with all the tourism industry. So we want to be very aligned with Travel Oregon, um, our local direct management organiza marketing organizations and business owners. So we're trying to be seamless in that partnership. Yeah, sorry, Mom. Oh, maybe I just needed to move it. You gotta wake it up, okay. So just some stats, uh, Jim and Miles talked a little bit about this. We all know Oregon's popular, people wanna move here. Tourism's on the rise. <coughs> all these different th jobs, 105,000. Um, but this is why they come here, the total participants per activity. This is a reason, um, I think they've just updated this study, but you look at uh, uh, 1,700 um, thousand participants come here to do wildlife viewing. It's a really big segment of why people come um, to the Oregon coast especially. It actually is more than fishing, hunting, and shell fishing combined. Um, just real quick on this graph, I want to point out leisure and hospitality. So this is Coos, Curry, and Douglas counties. And leisure and hospitality is right in the middle here. I wish you guys can't see it over there, but it's the one that the purple bar is so much higher. That means there's way more jobs um, in that industry than the other in Curry County than there is in those our two neighboring counties. So um, it's just very important segment of who is employed in, in this industry down here. Travel Oregon puts out the travel barometer. These are just some um, statistics I thought were important. You've seen the growth in tourism. It looks like it's growing again, about 5% this year. Um, lodging revenue is up 13%. A lot of visitors are flying into Oregon. And, and in fact, one of the cool initiatives we're trying to do with the Oregon Coast Visitors Association right now is fly into Coos Bay North Bend, rent a car, drive down, fly out of Crescent City. That's going to be a new sort of initiative we're doing. We've got some travel riders come to, to experience that in the fall. Um, so I think it might be a way for people to understand that you can get down to the south coast in about 35, 40 minutes, I think. So are you um, setting up special drive. deals for these folks? Yep. We have uh, Pen Air has given us free plane tickets. We're Good. paying for shuttling, and then we're coming up with an itinerary for them. So we're going to get them at the airport. We're going to show them everything between North Bend and uh, Crescent City, and then they're going to fly back, and then they're going to write about it. It'll be like, a, I think it's 10 writers hmm. in all different types of magazines, so it's, it's coming up. Cool. So I, I think that's an underutilized uh, oh, way yes. to get here, and it's a lot faster than driving five and a half hours, because we hear that all the time. We're too far away from Portland, so this may help people um, want to do this more often. Um, again, you see the increases in tourism. I don't need to talk about that too much. Whoa. I'm just going to get down to where we were. All right, I'm not the best at this either. Maybe we need to invest in another mouse. So, my work plan. I started last year. Um, a lot of what I'm doing is marketing. So when I say FAM tour host there, it's, it's a familiarization tour. So we get TV shows, travel writers. Um, they come down here. I actually get to take them around and show them all the fun stuff and connect them with different outfitters and, and take them to the mo uh, restaurants and then leave them at the motel, tired and exhausted. And, um, and then I pick them up the next day and we go do all this stuff again. So it's a it's really fun part of my job. I really like it. Um, we also want to market the existing assets that we have. And the one I like to bring up a, a, a lot is the Oregon Coast Trail. This is going to be, and it is, but it's going to get even better, um, a world-class through hiking destination. This, this trail is 360-some miles long. It's not complete, really. I mean, there's, t there's places where you're walking along Highway 101. It's not the ideal experience that we want for our visitors. So. Um, Enhancing that asset will be huge for us. And it's, what's really unique about it is a lot of these through hiking uh, destinations are in the wild. 
So there's not a lot of economic impact. But this Oregon Coast Trail hits every community all the way down the coast. So it's a different sort of hiking. You can go 30 miles and stay in a bed and breakfast. You can camp halfway through, but then stay in a motel the next night. So you've you got a nice variety and you're spending money. You don't have to have as big of a pack because you can eat out. Um, it's really so is this utilized more and more or? Okay. Yeah, and if, especially this year when we had so much snow. Mm -hmm. um, right now you can't <clears throat> go through the southern section of the Pacific Coast Trail. So I don't know if you've noticed, but there's been a lot more people walking with backpacks on Highway 101 and um, it's, it's an actual uh, visible increase. Also, the Wild Rivers Coast Scenic Bike, that was something that came out of our rural tourism studio. Um, you guys saw earlier. Um, finding ways to promote that. It's an existing asset and stewarding it. I happen to be the proponent for that, so I have to go and make sure that the signs are all up. Um, and if they're, they're not, I reach out to state parks and we get new signs put up there. Um, probably doing another event soon. We did a kickoff event last year, um, but trying to get more people to come and enjoy that beautiful ride. It's the only scenic bikeway on the entire Oregon coast. Hmm. Pretty cool thing. And then I get out and I talk to people about Aqua, so I do little presentations kind of like this. Um, I did miss one. Collaboration. So I'll go back to that. This has been a huge part of my job and it's it kind of drives me crazy a little bit because we have so many meetings there's so many groups working on tourism and miles knows about this and jim knows about this we are always meeting with these little groups about ways that we can work together to promote tourism um, there's the wild rivers coast action teams the coos what they're calling south coast action teams there's the international mountain biking chapter down here on in the wild rivers coast um, they're super motivated to do a lot of good work so i try and work with them when i can our strategic advisory board good um, group. People's Coast Summit that's coming up in Gold Beach at the Curry County Fairgrounds in October. This is going to be a great opportunity to learn more about tourism, to bring hundreds of people into Gold Beach in a time when we need the income. Uh, we'll fill up all the motels for that and hopefully um, employ some caterers and some local entertainment. Um, there's going to be a presentation on birding and economic impacts of birding and also a field trip to go birding and then we're going to take a ride on Jerry's jet boats. Hmm. A lot of stuff's coming up on that. We won't open registration until sometime in August so it's all just still we're coming up with all the different presentations and workshops. Um, working as the proponent for the bikeway, other community initiatives like uh, we worked at on the um, Coos Head enhancement process up there. They're, the tribes are looking at developing um, Coos Head as a possible tourism attraction and motel. Uh, and then product development, so coming up with new products that will um, draw tourists here. And, and another thing, I should have mentioned this mm -hmm. earlier, what we're trying to do is bring what I would call the right kind of tourists here. They're, they're the kind of tourists that will stay longer, spend more money, and want to take care of our resources. They're not the kind of tourists that are going to go trash everything and leave and, and never come back. These guys are going to stay longer and spend more money. They're the, the mountain bikers, they are a great... Um, draw for tourism. They'll come and they'll hit the trails all day long so they're not clogging up you know the cities with uh, too many RVs or whatever but they're out there playing. They come home, they're hungry, they're going to stay in a motel, they're going to go out to eat, go to the brewery um, and, and they're going to stay for multiple days if we have enough trails for them to ride. So we're trying to give them enough world-class trails to make them want to stay for three or four days. I think you just need to tap it. Now it's going the other way. Okay. So this is the boring part. I don't want to talk about administrative things, but I have to do a little bit of that. I got to keep email listings and our um, lists all right, and do outreach to new businesses, um, and hopefully we're going to have a, um, a rare intern. Um, help with all of this stuff, and, and they won't start until September. But I mean, we are getting a rare intern down here. Um, and they're going to help us get all these businesses into the Travel Oregon and Aqua uh, listservs and so that they're easily, more easily accessible. Um, so that's going to be nice to have some help with that. This thing is so sensitive. So some of the projects i just like to touch base or, or highlight real quick. Uh, we are working with the city of Brookings to this top left corner picture is, is a picture of a bike park. 
Um, so we're working with the city of Brookings to come up with a small grant for around $20,000 to do a feasibility and design um, project to come up with something like that for the city of Brookings. These are bike parks um, to, to build, they build skills. They get new riders excited about mountain biking um, by having all the little tricks and um, different level ability levels inside the bike park. And this is a way to get new, new kids stoked on riding and also uh, provide a place for tourists to come and play while they're here visiting. Um, so that's coming up in August, we'll be submitting that grant. And then hopefully if, if we get it, we'll come up with a good design that's repli replicable. So we can do these in all the communities that want them on the <coughs> South Coast. Um, there, there actually are a tourism draw. And then on the right is a new kind of mountain bike trail. It's a little just a, a highlight of one of the cool things that are on these new kinds of trails. And right now up in Coos Bay, they're actually digging a flow trail. They're, they call them flow trails because there's less just climbing and downhill. It's more kind of up and down to the point where you're not even pedaling as much as it used to be. You used to go mountain bike on hiking trails. It was kind of boring. You know, sometimes you're just going straight up, straight down. Well, these new trails incorporate things like that. Um, fun little scenarios that it's mountain bike specific. It's difficult. It's um, exciting when you're on it. It's not just dirt. You know, you're on. There's some rock. There's some wood. A lot of jumps and bank turns, and it's, it's really fun. Um, so that's happening right now on Coos County forest lands. And there, there's a little different situation in Coos County. They have a lot of timberlands. Mm -hmm. Close to Curry County, we don't really have any, or very little. Um, but there could be a partnership potential with Curry County lands, too. I think uh, you know, there's, there's an area here to, to work together. Um, and the bottom left is just an example of water trail guides, guidebooks. And so the Oregon Coast Visitors Association has funding to hire a coordinator and a planner to come up with um, a similar sort of initiative between Reedsport and Brookings. So we want to come up with not quite as extensive as this, but guidebooks for, or guide brochures for all the water trails. So the Rogue, the Chetco, Rogue, uh, Co Co uh, Coquille, and Coos, and Umpqua rivers. And also we're going to put a little more emphasis on the Coquille. Um, that's for doing developing infrastructure. We want to have a three or four day long paddle from a Myrtle Grove up above Myrtle Point all the way down to the city of Bandon. Mm. Um, so it's going to be exciting. Um, working with landowners about different types of lodging potential there so that they can take advantage of the uh, paddlers coming through and make a little money. Um, so that's a few things that we're doing. And here's another a couple more examples. A uh, little kid on a bike in the bike park. Um, it can be as simple as that, just some wooden ramps. It doesn't have to be that big concrete thing that we saw earlier. It could be dirt and wood as well. To the left of that is the scuba fill station that came out of the Wild Rivers Coast RTS. We're starting to promote that more. We're starting, they've seen an increase in tank fills um, every year since that thing started, I think a couple of years ago. Um, so that's on the rise. Um, Where's that located? It's in Port Orford at the OSU hmm. field station. Okay. Um, the next, we got another grant from Travel Oregon to um, develop diver infrastructure um, access. So what we're going to do is work with the Port of Port Orford on making a safer and easier way to get in the water. Right now it's kind of sketchy. You walk down along their seawater intake and you kind of jump off the rocks. And so we're mm. going to put in a ladder and some stairs and make it a lot nicer. Um, on the left is the Oregon Coast Trail. That picture is is from one of the viewpoints there that um, in Samuel Boardman right we really think the Oregon Coast Trail could be a huge asset for the entire Oregon Coast and we're also celebrating the Beach Bill so that other picture is um, a celebration of I think it's been 50 years since we've had public beaches so it's mm -hmm. very exciting it's one of the best things that <coughs> I think the Oregon Coast has to offer is free beaches people are blown away when you don't have to pay to actually go to our beaches we take it for granted a little bit. So, I'm going around there. so I guess that's my last one. If you guys have any questions for us, we're all three of us willing to answer questions. And well, I've had um, individuals approach me about ecotourism. Is there? And I noticed it was called nature tourism. Is that one and the same? Or yeah. yeah okay. I, mean, it's, I like nature-based tourism a little bit better, but they are the same thing. Okay. Some cases, certain places.
place in the world certain people, you know, use a label. So you can target those people with things that they consider ecotourism. From a business development, and it's really just from a setting of market. Oh. In general, they're the same thing. You can reach different people using different terminology. Yeah, I think our area is just a diamond in the rough, just waiting to, to happen here. Okay, Tom? Joe? No. Thanks, Dave. Well done. You have to work on the mouse a little bit. <laughs> There's probably a setting. You can make it well, maybe what we should do is have a workshop before yeah, we'll people come in here. Yeah, we'll have a workshop on mouse operation. <laughs> I know. I... Did you have any comments? You want to come up then? I just wanted to share with the, the board that, um, you know, you met back in um, April. And we talked about economic development, and we kind of walked through. Want to identify yourself? I'm Carolyn Johnson. I'm your community development director. We walked through a series of things that uh, we were going to be looking to do in this coming year, and this presentation today is kind of a culmination of of some of that work. Uh, we wanted these folks to come and, and give this presentation. Um, I sit on one of your working groups. I was I was uh, invited to do that. It's great. It's very inspirational. There's a lot going on in this area and uh, as you know we've hired SCDC as a contractor um, to work with us as well and I'd, I was hoping John could say a few words about some of their efforts and things that they're working on and um, with us to do so I'm really looking forward to our continued collaboration and uh, um, we'll be talking more for sure I think it's really great that we're working together because I think we can accomplish a whole lot more than just say an individual here in at Curry County doing it. It works better to have Oh yeah, I mean, you've you got some real talent and this is an amazing oh, yeah. opportunity. Um, and we are very limited in our resources in-house. So um, I like to think of these folks as extensions of our staff and mm -hmm. working for you in the county. So. I, I think yeah. it's a great idea to utilize them. John, did you have any comments? <coughs> uh, John Hitt, South Coast Development Council. Uh, commissioners, thank you, and I'll, I'll make it really super brief. Um, we service, as you know, from uh, Brookings to Florence, a little bit outside of the area, slightly outside of the area we've been talking about, Florence, wonderful beachfront uh, or, or near beachfront community, and it's really not their fault there in Lane County. So a little humor <laughs> there, but um, <clears throat> any event, uh, my predecessor, Connie Stouffer, was along with several other other folks that are here in the room today, uh, co-sponsors of the original uh, or, or the rural tourism studios, which kind of had the study groups, work groups up and down the South Coast area to kind of kickstart or re-kickstart some of these tourism efforts. We don't, unlike uh, Dave and unlike Miles and, and several others, uh, like people like Jody uh, here in Gold Beach, we don't, we're not on the ground, we're not here to actually directly promote tourism, but one of the things we do tr try to focus on is supporting those efforts. We agree totally that it's a, an important element of the economy. They talked about the number 17%. I think some of the investigations we've done, that could easily be moved up to 25 to 30% of our economy without negatively impacting anybody else, only positive impact. We've seen, in particularly over the last two or three years, jobs, the number of jobs here in Curry County, uh, tourism uh, related industries, leisure, hospitality, have grown very steadily, very nicely. We anticipate those, um, that growth will continue. And, th and again, our, our bottom line is, is bringing in new jobs. Um, <clears throat> you, the mention of increase in tourism, 4.5% uh, from 2015 or, or in the year 2015, I don't have any hard numbers to update that, but in circulating through the area here over the course of, uh, since this, our current tourism, summer tourism season really kicked off, talking to restaurant owners, motel owners, etc. How are you doing so far this year? The report unanimously is great. So I think we're going to see those numbers, Dave and Miles and, and Jim, tick up again uh, in, uh, in here in 2017. So obviously that's a good thing. Um, <clears throat> so with that, um, 
I'll conclude my remarks uh, unless, uh, Mr. Chairman, you'll let me fudge a little bit and talk about two things real briefly, not directly related to tourism. <laughs> and if you decline, that's fine, I understand. Well, that, that's not a trick question. What What would you like to... I uh, just uh, bring you up to date on um, uh, what I'm doing, uh, have been focusing in on for the last couple of weeks in the city of Brookings, and then also uh, give you some information update about our new uh, permanent executive director. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, we are doing a housing study uh, for the city of Brookings. Um, Hope to have at least a rough draft of that done in a couple of weeks and a final uh, paper present, uh, presented to the city of Brookings sometime in uh, uh, late August, early September. But what's uh, real clear so far, and we talk about job growth and bringing in uh, more ec uh, economic development, one of the things that clearly is a constraining component of that, at least for the Brookings area, and I really suspect far beyond Brookings, is affordable housing. It's so true. that is something that if we want to see that kind of job growth uh, in this industry and other uh, sectors, um, we, we need to take a close look at that issue. It's already constraining some of the larger employers in the area, uh, having trouble hiring folks from outside the area you know, with skills and talents that they can't <laughs> find locally to bring them in. A lot of people are turning them down saying, I'd love to come to work for your company, but I can't afford a house here or it, rather to rent or to buy. So I know the schools have had a problem. Yes. We've had yeah. teachers yeah. not be yeah. able to come because yeah. of that. And uh, talk to some of the medical profession folks, <clears throat> folks too, the same thing. That's true. And then just real briefly, uh, we have hired a permanent executive director, uh, Samuel Baugh. He will be on the job August 14th. So uh, I will, there'll be a probably two, three week transition when both he and I are, are here. Uh, we hope to then hire, uh, open, a, as I've discussed with you pre uh, previously, a uh, Curry County satellite office. That will probably come, um, need final uh, SCDC board approval, but that'll probably start sometime in September or early October. So I uh, hope to uh, uh, help and focus with all of you during that period of time. Haven't figured out a place yet, probably be either here, Gold, uh, uh, here in Gold Beach or in Brookings. But I will make sure our new director, Sam Ba, comes down and meets all of you. What was that? last name pronounced? Ba, B-A-U-G-H. Ba, okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. ah. Yes. Maybe a relative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. uh, unless you have any questions for me, I thank you for your time. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, John. I had one question. If you, if, uh, Moms, if you could come up, just, uh, you had, and I'm, I'm sure it was you that had mentioned in your presentation the photo that you know that, that that they've had a couple of them and now some of those where would those images be placed or how will, will the different municipalities or anybody for that matter be able to uh, access them so uh, good question so the grant I think we're uh, we'll have 260 plus images uh, by professional photographers of uh, the zone from Brookings to Bandon and those will be housed in an aqua shared system called Barberstock, which the DMOs, uh, the, so the Gold Beach, uh, uh, Brookings, Port Orford, um, and would be able to access to utilize as they need for promotional okay. purposes. Hmm. And that there is an online system so they can download them whenever they want them at whatever size they want. And that will be combined with additional photos that will be through that system that Aqua has and as we get more. And that that information would go once it's available to the to the, the, the municipalities then or yeah okay yeah in fact I think we'll probably have a special training and make sure everyone's okay. up to speed on that thank you do, do you have any other questions or I just say we need to move forward okay very great great presentation I think, great from all yeah. now on those <coughs> um, be it PowerPoint or the videos are those have something that uh, is available as public that that you know i think most of them you had on the on that little portable drive anyway or those may we may we use those i think we may even have seen some of those on the 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 breaks in that they're especially the one i think um the first one on the breaks that we have in our oh, no okay saying no different one it, it, okay I, I thought i saw some of the same 
people in some of those videos. Okay. 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 And we do have it on the on the the laptop computer too. Yeah, okay, so so maybe we access, maybe we use those also. So that'd be pretty cool to put it on our TV channel. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank the, you. The Wild Rivers Coast website has what looks to be a, a minute and a half video right on its right on its home page, and there may be other content. Because we use on the on the recesses and so forth on the meetings, they place different things from ODOT and whatever, and those might be, you know, or clips from those might be very applicable also, you know, to, to use. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. There's also some uh, uh, grant applications in the works that do another okay. bicycle video okay. and some guide training about guide videos. Okay. So I think, again, we'll thank all of the, the presenters great job on that great great job very very appreciated um, and I think then we'll move to the second item which <coughs> is not related whatsoever to, to tourism it you, you mentioned Dave some boring stuff this is really boring so, yeah. okay. so they're um, really gonna want to hang yeah, around yeah, right you don't have to <laughs> sit around through this um, yeah, why don't we take a, why don't we take yeah. a, yep. yeah, I take a, just, a I think. let's take a, let's say a nine minute, come back, it's 11.16, let's come back at 11.25, we'll just take a little break, and then that'll let John get set up for the, for the next boring. Thank you. Presentation, thanks Dave, good to see you. You know, you shouldn't call it boring, people are going to get the wrong idea. <laughs>
Cannon Beach is home to one of Oregon's most photographed natural wonders, Haystack Rock. Get your shots from the beach or take a short drive up to Ecola State Park and look down on this 235-foot work of art. The picturesque small town is filled with art galleries, shops, and cafes. Ready for more? Ten miles to the south, this is the view from Cape Falcon. You're 700 feet above the Pacific. Here, the Pacific Coast Byway has been carved out of Neocani Mountain and held in place by stone walls built in the 1930s by craftsmen in the Civilian Conservation Corps. Upon descending the mountain, the highway drifts inward around Tillamook Bay to Tillamook, the unofficial dairy capital of Oregon. The verdant valley of dairy farms in this area produces 25 million gallons of milk annually. Much of that is processed into natural cheddar cheese. And near more than 800 miles of navigable waters, Tillamook is a crossroads for North Coast recreation. From here, you owe it to yourself to veer off Highway 101 to explore the Three Cape Scenic Loop. This drive places you right at the beach, beginning with Cape Mears, home to the shortest lighthouse in Oregon. Nine lighthouses stand sentinel along Oregon's coastline. They're monuments to our maritime heritage, towering links to the past, and as much a part of the rugged Oregon coastal landscape as any offshore monolith. The Cape Mears Lighthouse was first illuminated in 1890. Oregon's oldest lighthouse is at Cape Blanco, the westernmost point in the state. It was commissioned in 1870 to aid shipping generated by gold mining and the lumber industry. The 93-foot-high Yaquina Head Lighthouse is the tallest in Oregon. Today, its automated light continues to aid navigation at the entrance to Yaquina Bay. Many of the lighthouses are open to the public. Most happen to be excellent places to view nesting seabirds and offshore sea life. Tide pools, those rocky areas between high and low tides, support unique and diverse plants and animals. Vast amounts of colorful, otherworldly creatures wait to be discovered. But walk cautiously. These organisms are tough enough to withstand the pounding surf, but are utterly vulnerable to human activity. Wildlife and sea life abound on the coast. There are six national wildlife refuges along the Oregon coast. The Pacific Coast Scenic Byway bisects these refuges or, or goes alongside them. It provides you the opportunity to see a wide variety of abundant wildlife, including seabirds, seals and sea lions, deer and elk, and many other wildlife. Cape Kiwanda lies at the southern end of the Three Cape Scenic Loop, near the town of Pacific City. Here you'll find a second haystack rock on the byway. Hike up the dune to marvel at stunning views of sandstone formations as they turn yellow, gold, or even red in the changing sunlight. If your timing is right, you'll spot one or two of the dory fleet sprint onto the beach after a day of fishing. How's this for a dinner setting? Restaurants along the Pacific Coast Scenic Byway accommodate just about any taste. Many serve an ocean view with every meal. Up and down the coast, you'll find seafood, of course, but don't limit yourself just because you're by the water. The Central Coast begins around Lincoln City, which is one of the larger communities on the byway. It has a reputation for being windy and was recognized by Kite Lines magazine as the best place to fly a kite in North America. It was incorporated from several small towns and as a result, offers a sandy beach that is seven and a half miles long. A number of small state parks lie nestled along the ocean between Lincoln City and Newport. Stop, get out of your car, and take in the commanding views that are there, right next to your all-American road. Depot Bay boasts the world's smallest navigable harbor, six square acres in all. A seawall runs the length of the downtown, so everywhere you go, you're rewarded with a dramatic view of the Pacific. It's considered Oregon's whale-watching capital, with thousands making their way past Oregon each fall and spring. Fishing and whale watching excursions regularly set sail from this little harbor. Leaving Depot Bay, you'll soon find yourself at Cape Foulweather, a basalt outcropping that looms 500 feet above the water. It was here in 1778, British Captain James Cook first sighted the mainland of North America on the Pacific coast. A fierce storm that almost put an end to his expedition earned this rugged stretch of coastline its name. Coastal weather can change by the hour. 
You will find a lot of wet days, but rain can become blue sky with white clouds in an afternoon. Mist kissing the headlands burns away, or storms can last for days. Some people come for those storms. Whether you find sunbursts of happiness or cloud cover like a quilt, there's always a reason to come back. Like Lincoln City, Newport is one of the larger towns on the byway. The historic bayfront on the north side of Yaquina Bay hosts one of Oregon's largest commercial fishing fleets. It has a busy, genuine working waterfront feel, with fish plants and boats coming and going from as far away as Alaska. On the south side of the bay is the Oregon Coast Aquarium. Share waters beneath the ocean with sharks and rays, and don't miss the sea otters at mealtime. Now, all four of our otters were rescued otters. They were found out in the wild. For the next 50 miles, your trip along Highway 101 hugs the coast. Many more state parks offer opportunities to stop and take in outstanding vistas, crashing waves, and offshore rock formations. Two small towns of note are Waldport and Yahats. Waldport sits on Alsea Bay where fishing, clamming, and crabbing are popular. The 40-mile stretch south of Waldport marks steep headlands, jagged volcanic outcrops, and jaw-dropping scenery, the rugged edge of the Oregon coast. Yahats is a quiet, unhurried artist town just a couple of miles north of Cape Perpetua. Drive to the top of this bluff and you'll be 800 feet above the water. On a clear day, you can see 70 miles of Oregon coastline. Drive past Hasita Head Lighthouse to the Sea Lion Caves. A quick elevator ride 200 feet down puts you in America's largest sea cave, the year-round home of wild stellar sea lions. Rugged cliffs give way to graceful beaches as you approach Florence. In the spring, be on the lookout for wild rhododendrons along the roadsides. Similar to Newport, you'll find an historic Old Town commercial district along the Sayuslaw River. Florence is the gateway to the Oregon Dunes National Recreation Area, a 47-mile sandbox of wind-sculpted sand dunes towering 500 feet above sea level. These are the largest expanse of coastal sand dunes in North America. Reedsport is at the center of the Oregon dunes, but you can do more than ride a dune buggy or motorcycle. A short three miles east of town on Highway 38, more than 100 Roosevelt elk reside at the Dean Creek Elk Viewing Area. Early mornings or just before dusk are the best times to photograph the herd. Paying homage to Oregon's timber heritage, Reedsport hosts an annual chainsaw sculpting championship, a time to watch three-dimensional artwork come to life right before your eyes. Mountains of sand continue at Winchester Bay. You'll also find an active marina here. It's a great place to try your hand at crabbing or take a charter for salmon or bottom fishing. The dunes end and you enter the coast's largest urban area at Coos Bay. It has the deepest natural harbor between Seattle and San Francisco. Foreign vessels sail under the massive McCullough Bridge. You may have noticed, dotted along the Pacific Coast Scenic Byway, are many beautiful and iconic bridges. The Megler Bridge in Astoria, Yaquina Bay Bridge in Newport, Halsey Bay Bridge in Waldport, Sayusla River Bridge in Florence, and the magnificent McCullough Bridge in Coos Bay are works of art in their own right. Charleston is slightly off the byway at the mouth of the bay. It was once an old waterfront fishing village. Okay. Yeah, I've got, I have copies too oh, okay. or, that I made. Oh. No, no, no. I just wear one, but it's starting to be blurry. So I figured I'd better go get some glasses. But then they make me dizzy, so. That guy from Band and Dunes is sure a nice gentleman. Okay, we're back on <coughs> live here. It's 11, we'll call it 11.30, back from a break. Uh, it's, again, Wednesday, July 26, 2017. Um, 
which is a board commissioner workshop. The second item on the workshop is meeting minutes. And this is our samples. Pardon me? Our samples. Yes. Correct. So, John, Jesu, do you want to? Okay, if I stay here, you want well, why don't you? No, I think once you go head up to the to the podium, and <coughs> I'm I'm going to suggest maybe we use the uh, what I call the Elmo, or somehow project these onto the either, large screen. Either the Elmo, or or if you have the files, it would be cleaner. They're they're in the uh, in the packet that was. Put for that up for this meeting. Okay. Well, we so could, we can, could. Can we access the packet? Sure. On that sure. Yeah, we, would wouldn't want, we wouldn't want the audience the to miss of, this excitement. Of, of pages, it would be much cleaner if we want to put those up. Um, Let's see. Seven pages, ten pages, and, and nineteen pages. Okay. Yeah, let's see here. You'd probably need a little help, but but sort of watch what what he's doing here, John. As far as Okay. Oh, we might not use the Elmo. I think but what, does that what, this is, but don't don't go away, Charles. This is a he's got a PDF on the actual hard drive, so it would be cleaner for and put it in there. Pardon me. I don't have it on the thumb drive. Well, you have a thumb drive, right? We just need to go get one. I'll go get one. Yeah, that would be the cleanest because you have so many pages versus the. Oh. To right put them on the Elmo. Right, yeah. So, but the PDFs are not on here. Right. So you can take them from that computer, put them on that, and then put them in and put them in the lab. This computer. Uh, right. Or, or so. yours, whichever. Well, you, whatever you're comfortable with. Okay. Sure. We'll see in a little bit. All right. Thank you. Okay. Glad we got but some techies. I don't know what you're talking basically, about. Basically, uh, what has been done here, and what uh, what will be showing here shortly <coughs> is uh, the board was looking at the format that we want to choose for minutes of the Board of Commissioner meetings, be it a workshop or primarily the general meetings. And John Jesuit, who does the minutes, had created, ha had chosen, I think randomly, but had chosen one uh, general meeting and it will be April 5th 2017 and he did a long version or which was approximately the this was a seven or so hour meeting so 19 pages uh, um, it did a, that was eight approximately 18 pages he did another version a shortened version that was approximately 10 pages and then a shorter version that was seven pages I believe so uh, this is just going to be re to review. All of these are on the packet for the workshop for today. So they're all online on the county website. Um, and we'll be just going through what's going to work best to create a, an acceptable written, doc per written permanent document. And that's the key here is that uh, written minutes are per the, the Secretary of State Archive Division Director permanent and a requirement of meeting, ultimately requirement of meeting minutes. So as soon as John uh, Jesuit gets those on a, a little thumb drive, he'll put them on the, the, uh, the laptop computer here so we can project them on the, on the screen. So as he goes through, he can explain it. County Council, you have any comments you want to add before? No, as uh, I, I think you did a really good okay. job of summarizing what uh, has been presented to the board, and uh, John is, you know, basically transferring the documents, and uh, he's responsible for the minutes and what we're trying to do. And, and the minutes are really we take direction from the board on on what level of minutes. You are correct; they are permanently retained documents. Um, for the uh, archivist of uh, Oregon administrative rule. And therefore, they're very important. And um, legally, they have some minimum requirements uh, per the Attorney General Public Record and Meeting Manual. Uh, 
essentially, I think they have to show the attendance. They have to show who was there and the record of the vote with some description of the discussion of the action item. But from what I've seen, um, they, they can be far less than what we have done in the past. And, and our minutes in the past, uh, depending on how far back you look, um, have basically varied. We didn't have a single standard of minutes. So I have a question. All of these are legal, right? I am going to say um, yes. It looks like all the motions are covered and the attendance. <laughs> and so I guess the next question would be, how many hours did John spend on each one of these? Because I think the amount of time, that we, clerical time, we use for these needs to be considered. That was addressed previously, but okay, so this is up, so... This, this is the very shortest one. Which, which one do you want to start with? Well, the, well, the long one uh, is 19 pages. And that is um, way on the bottom. If I may, I'd, I'd yeah. like to take one further comment and go a little bit further from what uh, County Council had just said, uh, because we're, what this is is a compromise. Mm -hmm. But it's a, what we feel is a reasonable, satisfactory right. compromise. And I think um, uh, it was good that you had the different examples, because we don't want to take it literally and get too detailed mm -hmm. and to the absolute letter of the law because to take it a little bit further with with county council that for anyone interested that would be on the public meeting section on the 2014 uh, attorney general's public meeting and records law manual which they have provided online. It's a free download. Anybody that might or might not be interested, there's also uh, a book for $25. This happens to be that I'm holding up the two, you know, the 2014, which is the latest edition. But page 153 starts with minutes and record keeping. And as county council said, it you know it needs to to show. Uh, what they're saying is the record of a meeting, whether preserved in written minutes or a sound video or digital recording, shall include at least the following. Uh, the members present, motions, proposals, resolutions, the results of all votes, um, the substance, and here's one where we have to compromise, and they're, but they're very specific, the substance of any discussion on any matter. And there's where we have to be mm -hmm. re reasonable. Um, well, I mean, you can and do it verbatim, you know, but it would Okay, be. well, that's not what they're saying. But, I know, I'm just but, saying. But I'm saying, even you take a seven-hour meeting and to, to, to compromise, I, I don't expect, and I think we'll be exceeding anything that is, is a reasonable expectation, but we don't expect for you to have the substance of every, everything that's been talked about by every person to take that too literally, and I think that's where we need to be, you know, reasonable and and we're not going to have the substance of any discussion on any matter necessarily but i think all three examples were good so i'll, I'll you. leave you to to offer your comments as you as you go through that well the, for the first one the 19 pager which is not up here uh the 19 pager was is just about as accurate as a, as detailed without being a transcription as i could possibly get it that's the one that we talked about uh, june 14th on june 14th uh, the, the result was redo these, make, them, make it shorter, give us a summary, and Commissioner Gold specifically asked for times uh, because if someone wants to see exactly what I said at, kind of, you know, on this topic we, we covered, put the time that we covered that specific topic. So that's what I did with the shortened version. But then as I was going through it, I realized that um, that the heart of it was uh, County um, Accountant Kallstrom. She had a nine or, uh, a document that she had up here, and I'm copying and paste that I had to. I'm copying and pasting. You know, her point number one was uh, was pasted onto the minutes. And then I thought, well, that that's that's with that's on the one that's the um, the shortened version does not have that. I'm sorry, the more shortened version has not had that. The shortened version has that comment. I'll show you what I'm... 
I like recommendation two. We already, uh, Ms. Kallstrom gave that to us in a sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. So the more shortened version has this eliminated recommendation. Yeah. So this is what increases the length of, of the shortened version. The more shortened version does not have this. If I could ask a question, it sounded like we, what you said is you cut and paste. So that, that in the gray box there, is that a cut and paste from a document that Louise Kallstrom yes. submitted to the, okay. So maybe a, a really good thing, and I think it's great when people present you documents. You could say, look at item whatever and have that document available. Right, so then if that's the case, and in the minutes are paper form, then that those documents will be stapled to the back of the paper? They, they can be. The, they actually talk about documents um, in, in the public record of meeting law. What it says is um, you, the minutes have to have a reference to any document discussed at the meeting. Um, so you, you could uh, say, for instance, here, um, you, you would refer to <coughs> the document that, that you took this from and whether that would be, you know, memorandum from Callstrom to board dated, you know, April, what is it, 15th or? It's April, yeah, this is April 5th. April 5th, uh, 20, 2017. So you would, you would kind of, um, not quite like a bibliography, but you would show what document that is a cut and paste from. Um, but still cut and paste from that document or just say reference well, I, I, I think you could reference a document, but you also, um, it goes back to where the chair said the art is, and that is uh, describing the substance. Now, I think because, and, and what this talks about when it talks about the documents, it says referring to a document doesn't change the status of that document in the public records law, and different documents have different retention schedules, so it would be a, a pity if for instance, in the future, we had permanently retained minutes. We did not, and we referred to a document that was not permanently retained. So if someone's reading the minutes, they go, oh, I'm going to go find that document, and it's gone. That's mm. where I, I like what you've done here. I agree. What you've done here, taking the important substance from the document, putting it in the minutes for permanent retention. But then the only thing I would suggest adding to this would be a reference to the document that you're taking it from, okay. which seems to be a re requirement of the statute. Um, and then also, if that document's around, someone could find it. But if not, you've shown your source of where this block quote comes from, mm -hmm. and, and we'll know, okay, in a memo she presented, they had that, and that's the verbatim. So. Uh, but but so when you said the shortest version does not have this does language not, this in it, is, this is not in the shortest version. I, I, is there some description of what option two or recommendation two no. was? No. So I think I would think that the shortest version, if it doesn't contain a description of the option, I think people could could argue that we're not catching the substance. I mean, in general, you could, you know. So that's where. I think that's the compromise the chair was talking about. And so that's I agree just, with <coughs> County, <coughs> County Council. I discounted or basically eliminated your shortest version mm -hmm. for that and a, 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 a couple, right. three other reasons. I, I, that, that I just didn't think it was enough. But I think to paste like that, and this is going to be more, this is more an exception to what is normally there because we were getting ready for the budget process. Right. So exactly. this is not this is not going to be typical of right. of your of your general meetings. This is going to be the real exception to the rule. And I would think that we'll that document this. would be okay. really important especially yeah. dealing so, with budget. So so this this copy and pasting like this is not the, what I would expect to see in probably 90% right. of the minutes anyway. So I, I I like the way you did it here, Thank you. Well, in the in this in this version, and definitely like the times that you added. Mm -hmm. Thanks, um, Commissioner Gold. And that that came up I think after review of the first. Well, and set I think that would help the chair well, not I, having to 
it, it will help anybody because anyone that's really interested can go and then go to the video go to the video and very quickly because it's this, this video on demand so that you can you can drag mm -hmm. that anywhere you want in a be it a one hour meeting or a five hour meeting and get there quickly and it can it can make getting there possible where without that it's effectively not possible. I have a question about the times. Mm -hmm. They're spoken of at 10.07 a.m. Now is that at minute seven on the tape based on the meeting starting at 10 o'clock and so you're saying it's at 10.07 a.m. or or does the that's when you're looking at the how are you able to derive because the, if the meeting start yeah so 11 a.m. would be hour one on the on the timer. Correct. And then uh, so, so if something showed up at hour one on the timer, you would put 11 a.m. Right. Okay. So that, so, and then what about if we take a recess and there's a, a different, I mean, I could see, I could see a indirect correlation or some oh, separation of the, the minutes on the clock. Okay, good. So you're. But Commissioner Huxley. Well, we talked, yeah, about that. And I thought we agreed on which way you know you would do that you include the time in between so that anybody anytime can start at 10 so if you had a lunch break and it doesn't matter because that's in the video anyway we have the recess or a lunch break it shows it, all those it's being video castles and all that no i understand so at one o'clock would be one o'clock or or three hours that would be three hours into the video right two o'clock because it never stops Two o'clock, regardless of whether you had Thank lunch you. or not, I would be not four hours into the video. <clears throat> so, when, so that's interesting. So, our our meeting videos when there's a break or executive session, when the 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 recording of that meeting will show through the break our our filler yeah. information. Correct. Yes. Okay. So then it, it wouldn't matter. Otherwise, it's it's almost. So then this is well, real time. Track. In okay. real time. Plus Thank or minus you. a couple, a yeah, minute or good. two, you know. Yeah. Sure, and, and it, that's also not going to be an example. And I think that's important because okay. if people want to go look at the, the details, they can go back to the video. Mm -hmm. And for, 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 yeah, for two, three minutes and find it instead of, as Commissioner Huxley was mm -hmm. observing, take hours to find it. Right. Because part of it is that, you know, we don't necessarily start at 10 a.m., 10 one zero colon zero zero colon zero zero and then I'm relying on that clock there which may not be the same time as Charles has for this. Mm -hmm. okay but right okay so it's, it's close I, right Very so close. that's that's what I was getting at um, I, really how you derive at those figures and they're linked and that's that's good enough for my that satisfied my question I did have John and it's just on page on the shortened version <coughs> so this is the middle of the road on page four, I circled three times because I questioned those. And this, you know, assuming that we would ultimately go with this version, I questioned 1134, 1136, and 1150. If you would just check that, I think that actually occurred. Well, that's right. The I don't after uh, when we move things around. Yeah. This agenda is ah. Uh, is the original so so when, when the commissioners say let's move item 7a to 11b i leave it on 7a and just okay unless you want me to rewrite the not, no, not no, rewrite no, the no, no 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 okay uh, so that may account for what so, right so happened there so just um let's go back and just recover what i think john just said so your starting template for your minutes is the meeting agenda right and what you're doing is on each topic that exists on the agenda then you're just taking you're almost doing the minutes for each topic mm -hmm. as they go and then sometimes they're moved okay Did, but that would still then if you went on on the, the to the 1134 if you went on that agenda item and went to one hour 34 minutes into the video you would or about right. there you'd find it okay and I, I make a note on my minutes of which items are moved from where you know oh, things okay. are taken out of okay. consent calendar Things are moved to administrative. Yeah, I, I think what's important is we need to make it as easy as possible for you so you're not spending an inordinate time doing minutes. That would be helpful. <laughs> it'd be, no, it'd make, just, it'd make yeah. the position more efficient. Yeah. The other thing which I wanted to piggyback on to a letter because you've uh, 
he read a letter from uh, Mr. McDonald, I believe, about mm -hmm. prairie trans recycling. So that's quite easily done. You know, I've got the letter there I can cut and paste. What about today, Moss Adams, Ms. Johnson's made other presentations, where are PowerPoints? Ken Duque, you know, how, do, how does a PowerPoint, for example, there was, I counted 32, 33 slides <coughs> today, and then every, every now and then, Commissioner Gold, you've had a comment on there. You know, and then they would, not, not very many, but then good. the speaker here would, would address your, your comment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So where I'm taking the minutes there is slide number three, and then who the speaker is. And then if you commented, I'd, I'd write down the answer that the speaker gave to your, your question or comment. And, then, and, and, and you were the one speaking for the most part in the meeting. It, when, but but Moss you Adams, talk. you know, everybody spoke when Moss Adams presented. When Ken Case was here, you know, people There's were... A, there is the subjective, you know, I mean, the point where, again, we can't take it totally, literally. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'd never... But uh, how do I put the slide? Yeah, I, I, and quite like, frankly, I don't think every comment I ever make is important. So. I, I, would like, I would like to offer a suggestion. So a, a PowerPoint is a document, mm -hmm. and I think um, just as similar, but it's going to be slightly different because it's not a text document, uh, similar to what you did with the cut and paste mm -hmm. from Louise Kallstrom's recommendation number two, I think what you could do is if you had the time and I think if you say, you know, uh, I'm trying to remember what these folks are called, Oregon Coast, you know, Alliance or something Oregon like Coast, that. There's a Wild Rivers Coast, Coast Alliance. Alliance. Wild, or Wild Rivers Coast Alliance, something along those lines. So, so you could say, you know, all the, whoever the three different people were, and I, I, it was clarified for me that Mr. Uh, Miles Phillips was technically, he was with Oregon State University Extension. So. Uh, we actually saw two presenters and two two sets of slides. Right. So I think you know, identifying who they are per the title, what time they showed up, and then again the statute says you refer to a document. I think a, a legal definition of a document can also include an electronic form of a document. You can certainly print out a PowerPoint. They have those. Mm -hmm. But I think if you just talk about here's the document here was the subject matter he said this commissioner gold asked that the answer was this mm -hmm. well today was, can, was 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 very few um, questions but i remember when uh, mr decay was here with cch um you know there were probably four or five questions comments answers with almost every slide of, the, of his presentation you know so it was pretty so the cut and paste would be the slide right up here. But then there's you know, four or five comments about that particular slide. And then there's the next slide. And so, um, I, again, I, you know, and, and you could have five different people would have five different comments to, or responses. My, my, my response would be, don't take it too literally right. there that that you could say something to the effect that uh, there were five comment five general comments from the slide you know on the slide and leave it at that mm -hmm. versus take two pages or a page to go into the detail on those five comments. and not only that there was no action and taken you're, so. and you're still right. referencing the, the the source document mm -hmm. right okay so that would be my suggestion I'd you know <clears throat> right, it's a compromise. It, it, sure, a, re a reasonable compromise. Yep. Yeah. I, I think if if any of the commissioners in their comments indicate um, support or not, in other words, what is someone looking at this going to want to know? Um, <coughs> because I'll, from the legal, from the end user of some of these, um, uh, sometimes our decisions will be reviewed uh, by maybe a court or a land use board of appeals or something like that. And if you look in the minutes, uh, and sometimes you can, you can derive what was the intention of the action, because sometimes there's even an argument over, well, what did they, in, did they intend this or did they intend, intend that? And a lot of times, just when you vote, you don't get into some of the subcontext. Um, so sometimes, in some of the comments where it's like, I'm doing this because, or 
I feel this way because I think if there can be a general description, um, so uh, like a general description can be Commissioner X disagrees with the presentation, or because you know, and then put the because in there, mm -hmm. right? So supporting the request, I'm looking at these sample minutes. Um, there is a request to make a. This is a. This is about crabbing. There was a request to make a certain area off limits. Supporting mm -hmm. the request was a someone from the commercial crabbing industry. He testified that uh, the extended take of sports fishermen was decreasing the potential of the commercial take. Um, and he said it was excellent breeding ground. And then opposing the <coughs> request were um, marina operator uh, and a representative of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they disputed that. So. Um, and so it basically said who was there, what they spoke for, who was against, what what they said right. and why. And then there were, it said the commission considered a written report prepared by the Devi Department of Environmental uh, Quality titled The Effects of Sports Crabbing on Crab Populations. And then it just said, you know, a commissioner moved that uh, Mr. Franklin investigate the claim and get back to the commission. Um, and that that was mainly it. So that's that was i have a feeling that probably took longer than those two paragraphs but in one paragraph they said who was there speaking for what they said on the other it said who was against what they said a little bit and then um, basically that they really just said they disputed his testimony right. and then there was a, a an independent report from the deq about the subject and then the commissioners wanted more information from staff so that's really um <clears throat> but that's what i used to model the shortened version good okay and then the, the more shortened version was my idea <laughs> yeah. sure okay well that's um so, so if that helped uh john and and the other part about this is you'll be preparing them uh they'll be submitted to the board and so the board will have an opportunity to, uh, during the review and approval of the minutes, to, to edit them and to say, you know, I, I really, it was very important to me that this point be made, and I, made, and I looked at where we had this discussion, thanks for putting the time in, and I went back there and I found that uh, I actually said this and I'd like that to be put in the minutes. I mean, I think, I think that's entirely right. possible. So if, if it were me, I would start with, you know less information it sounds like the short version is not acceptable the middle version is closer well, start the short, with something the, excuse me the, the short he, he called one that's let's call it the shortest short and, the short and the long sure and, yeah, well we had a seven pager a ten pager yeah, and a 19 a, pager so yeah. the, the 10 pager sounds like a good starting point Correct. it seems like at this point um the the commissioners here are okay with it um and then if there's anything in particular that any particular commissioner wants to include in the minutes, that's through the review process. And if I could talk a little bit about the review process, it was established before I got here. Um, draft <coughs> minutes were placed in a folder called to be reviewed. And the idea was each commissioner then would go in and, and make comments of what they'd prefer to see and then those would be incorporated into the final version that would go on to a minutes. And the process that had been established was that the minutes wouldn't go into a meeting agenda for approval until every commissioner had marked off that they had reviewed them. And I, I, I wouldn't want to just wait for that to happen. I would more or less say, you know, you have two days to review them or some, give a timeline, kind of a, not necessarily a speak now or forever hold your peace, but we're going to put these on an agenda you have it's very similar to the agenda prep you know the items come in we all have a duty to review them before publication we have like two or three days and then we just put them on i would i would almost do that uh john and and in fact it sounds like as i'm talking that myself through this we would simply submit the minutes as an agenda item for to be reviewed like any other I would prefer that. Yeah, okay. Would it be uh, subject to uh, the deadline, for example, uh, today's meeting? Let's say I get the minutes done by Friday afternoon. Would they be on the August 2nd meeting, or would we have to wait till the August 16th I, meeting? I, I would put them on, they, they wouldn't be ready to meet the deadline for an action no. item. So whichever, the minutes that you get ready, by the time 
of the deadline for an action item comes in, submit them as an agenda item for approval. Okay. And what, what, again, <clears throat> I want to say not a caveat, but uh, what had occurred in the past, what the objective I think is, the goal is to do the minutes from the last meeting to be approved the next hopefully meeting. at the next meeting. Okay. But and, and there, at that point, a couple of days can be reasonable to review. What's not reasonable is the history that's, that's occurred. Months and years back. Months backlog. and years back. Mm -hmm. or, or, and mm -hmm. in this case, it would be months. Now, you may have, you know, you've been taking good notes, but I would not expect or I would not be able to, to do it or, and, uh, or be expected to do it to have you put down a month or two months of old mi minutes and expect me to review them in two days right because right. that's some one of that me will we'll go back it's a, a you, you have well, to go we, back to some of the videos we too. will we will need to do more than one per meeting yeah. otherwise yeah. we'll be it will be in a perpetual well uh, no I, I agree behind, I but to but the first goal as far as a priority priority to be the last meeting minutes first so, so that at least we can and catch up there and then go back. Could I, I say one more thing right. here? Otherwise, we're, we're, we're oh, yeah. always, you know, okay, I, Commissioner, go. I think it's going to be important that all the commissioners read the stuff ahead of time and make mm -hmm. their corrections ahead of time so we don't waste a whole lot of time in the meetings doing it. Agreed. Otherwise, it'll just and, and that's what drive that, you crazy. That's, that's, I agree with that completely. Okay. What about Two to one. Workshop or minutes. Whatever. Workshop minutes count as the same value as uh, uh, general meeting minutes. Uh, uh, we can, you know, because like Commissioner Goldson, go around, but it's a public if, meeting. If, if I could, if I could, um, it, I think John's question is good. When you say the same value, the idea of the minutes is to document decisions. We don't really make necessarily decisions in workshop, but what the workshops become is the record of a future decision. A lot of times how you handle your business for time management is you have a workshop where you study items. Let's call it the travel policy. Let's call it getting a county administrator. We've had a workshop on each of those and we've had, you know, potential decisions on each of those. But if you wanted to know, well, was the county administrator supposed to be able to do this or to do that, or what did they say about that? You're actually going to have to go back to those some of the workshop minutes to find that out. So, um, or even is. yeah. So so. Um, it, but I'll be honest with you. I think a, a workshop on a county administrator is a little bit more important than the workshop we had today, as far as minutes goes. Mm -hmm. um, the, the you know the. So to, to talk about, we had a very general discussion there. What we didn't have any anticipated future action. Uh, it was not, I won't, uh, you know, I didn't perceive any particular contention or uh, it, it's, so I think, I think John, if you're getting the gist there and the drift that um, you're in these meetings, you should be not necessarily taking the temperature of the room, but you should be able to get <coughs> a good feel. And that's kind of where we're relying on your professionalism to mm -hmm. kind of to kind of help us when doing the minutes, I think. We have to. Yeah. It has to be that way. Well, basically, you get to, uh, if you can boil So it I kind of have a question oh. here because I, I like things to run smoothly. Could we or do we need to have a policy stating that commissioners need to read these ahead of time and make corrections ahead of time? I, 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 I don't know if you need a policy for that, but essentially by by just including the minutes as a normal action item on your normal agendas. Consent calendar, it's, which is where they typically well, been. I think, so here's, here's, here's what I'd suggest, and, and here's how I think it should work, because um, this is what I do when I review the agenda items, and I review all the AGRSs. Um, I, at least that's my, my goal. Sometimes I don't, but you know, there's, a, there's items on the AGRSs, for instance, the legal impact. I'm supposed to be reviewing that and filling out saying yes, no, what have you. If there's an order that is missing some language, I'll tell Brenda, hey, let's fix this. If there's an agreement that has some elements gone or a, or a, or an ordinance or something, I'll work on getting it fixed between the time of submit, middle and publication. And then we have it in the agenda to act on. So I think the commissioners, you have the ability to look at these minutes 
and suggest changes between the time of submittal and publication. That's just normal like any other item. To make a special rule for minutes, I don't think we need it. It's a standard. And then I would, I would never want to cut off the commissioners from saying, oh, well, because you didn't do anything ahead of time, you can't talk about it at a meeting. I think the meetings are just too important to, to you know, bar any of you elected officials from, from you know, and, and again, human nature as well. Oh, I couldn't get to it. I forgot. I missed this when I was looking at it. I looked at it since. I mean, there's so many different ways to catch mistakes and even your own mistakes or misses that I, I wouldn't want to make a hard rule mistakes? like that. Mistakes? I, well, I meant you. I didn't mean you personally. That was you in the I'm abstract. I'm kidding. Your own. But the minutes have to be approved unanimously? No, sir. No, they just have to be approved like any normal. That, that I don't know. Your problem. point there is yeah. was to where to play where where then. Uh, I would you prefer they be. I would prefer they be on the consent calendar. Okay. But the Definitely. the way. To, but Commissioner Gold was saying then should we have a requirement that they be looked at beforehand and uh, and it's like we have that we sort of have that requirement on every item. Uh, you all are able to look at these things before they get published. So. I'm just proposing we handle minutes the same as anything yeah. else. Yeah. But uh, and, and and then, but will the default place for them will be the consent calendar. The idea being that prior to publication, you all have had some time to look at them. And again, uh, like we just discussed, some topics. Let's say, for instance, we present the minutes on the budget hearing, or something like that. My hunch is uh, those either you know we can put we can start those on the consent calendar, but. Um, you know, I don't know that every minutes would go on the consent calendar if we anticipate there will be some discussion on them. So okay. it's, it's, it's just going to be a judgment call again on John and mine's part when we're putting the agenda together. Uh, the default, we will try to put them on the consent calendar as much as possible. And I think I'm, I'm going to give you another good example that would go right into okay. what was just said there as far as where something might go. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we had, again, a sh the shortest version a short version and a longer version. We're pretty much in agreement. We'll go with uh, the the short the one in the version, the one in the middle. But now let me, let me give you an example of what where I would want, you know, on a particular one more more information. And I think, based on what you did on the longer version, this is where we get back to this discretion. Okay, and judgment, and it needs to be, I think, for the most part, your discretion and judgment. Uh, on seven, <coughs> on this particular one, on item seven. Which for you're looking at the 19-pager? I'm, I'm looking at, at the 19-pager, and I'm looking at the shortened version. But more it's the topic and the subject and what um, contention there was an expansion on your part on the longer version on 7C uh, Secret that went on for over a page and certainly you could count on me if we had another subject like that and you had just five lines that I would request much much more that went on for 25 or 30 minutes right. on right. that but you know that and I just to keep that in in mind I think sure. um, I think you know exactly what, yes, what what I'm what I'm talking about there. Okay. Okay. So, so. Um, August second meeting deadline to get uh, items on there is 5 p.m. today. So it would would it be appropriate to put the uh, April 5th minutes for approval on the August second meeting? It's okay with me. Yeah. Yeah, we got to get started somehow. Or sometime. Yeah, and if if you're able to do another set, I'd, I'd say do another set as well. I would ask, you know, here, but I would certainly request at the actual meeting to have more of the expansion that you had on the long version on that versus the short, and we can, you can count on that. The first meeting I took minutes at was March 29th. So I think, I think John, what I just heard is we'd like to use the short version uh, or the the ten page version, but use as much as you can from the nineteen page version on item seven C. Okay. The secret meeting and, discussion. And, uh, correct. And I think you you know if that were to come up again, I would hope that 
I, I wouldn't expect to have to say anything. I'd expect that, uh, that you would know. It's going to your judgment of, you know, it, 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 what, w where the commissioners have an item that's important to them, hmm. maybe expand a little bit on that or be more inclusive than not. And, you know, uh, I have a question for the chair and the board. It goes to the naming protocols. Um, for instance, as I look through these and, and you have everyone called out in bold, which is very helpful to me, but um, there's been some discussion of naming protocols in the past. For instance, the first time someone's name comes up in a meeting and when you're making the minutes, the first time you say, okay, county council huddle, but then after that you could just go huddle and if people want to know who that guy is, they can go back and look. Could it um, save you time? I say go for I'm, it. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, see where I'm going no with, that? with that? Okay. So, so right. I was wondering if you were cutting and pasting these or typing them out. But typing them out. I would, I would. So that's been a protocol we've discussed in the past on minutes. The first time, you know, so instead of calling Louise Callstrom County Accountant Callstrom every time, once you've identified who they are and their title, in the first instance, you can just, you know, use the last name at that point. That would save you quite a bit of time, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, it would. I do one other. You know, I guess it would be a request, suggestion slash request. Um, at the beginning of all of the minutes, you had, say, support staff present, and it's typically three or four people. Mm -hmm. You know, many, many, many times we'll have the audience with right. a lot of staff members. Mm -hmm. You know, I would like to. to throw out the possibility of including the staff well, I members. I include Ms. Kallstrom on this President. one because she was yeah. speaking. But many of them, you know, will come up right. at some point in time, but to identify, and occasionally they do, which I think is nice, they'll, they'll do a quick zoom of the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not They don't focus on it, but they just do a quick zoom, but I would like to see. Well, a good example of the would staff be July members. 19th with Assessor Colin. Pardon me? July 19th with Assessor Cohen because yeah. someone said the, 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 the Board of Commissioners could use your presence and then you observe, here comes the Assessor right yeah. now. So yeah. getting, getting back to the point, um, and again, you've got the bold on the names, but if you look at these in the very beginning, you describe, you know, Chair Thomas Huxley, Vice Chair Sue Gold, Commissioner Court Boyce, County Council Huddle. What you know, what you might be able to do, if just one time, real quick, just say. So there, you've identified who everyone is, and then you could just, um, you know, you could either say chair or Huxley, in my opinion, and then um, you could say council or huddle. I think mm -hmm. gold is shorter than vice chair. You know, so mm -hmm. I think I think right. you've identified who everyone is up there, um, and and you know, I think that would help. That would save you, I think, a lot of time. Better Whatever point. it takes to save you time. Thank but you. if, if again, we had, you know, four elected officials in the audience, I would like to see yeah. them right. identified as support staff or staff or whatever you want to call them. Well, person. and that would be up in the... Exact, yeah. just at the top. So I think there's nothing I, wrong with that. I have a suggestion as well, Mr. Chair, because um, this is kind of a group effort here. But, um, you know, you do a good job at the beginning of every meeting. On my left is County Council Huddle, Vice Chair Commissioner mm -hmm. Gold. I'm Chair Tom Huxley. We have Commissioner Boyce and John Jesuit. If you see staff or other elected officials sure. in the audience, you might say in the audience we have We could do that. We could just start that doing way, that. Well, and that would help. It makes it easier for, right. yep. for, for John. Yep. Yeah, good point. So he, has, so he has a second source besides yep. just his memory yep. uh, of being able to do okay. that. Okay. Yeah, well, that's been, this been very good helpful. Job. John, do you need any other direction at all on this? No, I am. Um, no, okay. Good job. But, well, I, just to reconfirm, so the first uh, meeting I took minutes, that was March 29th. So March 29th and, and then take two, me, uh, two the, the, the target is two minutes, two meeting minutes until we get, per, per meeting until we get caught up. Started with March yeah. 29th. And these ones, of course, since they're April 5th, and we've looked at them a couple of times now, make mm -hmm. sense to put in there as well. Okay. Okay. We get three the first time. <laughs> yes. Good job. Okay. Good job. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, that's all we had on that Be topic. Then. Before, I'll just make a, a quick comment here that I should have done at the beginning of the meeting. There was a signage here, but the Curry County Fair opens today at 10 a.m., so it is open. 
uh, and that there's a parade Saturday, this coming Saturday at 11 a.m. And that was on the, the notice. And I did see a hand for Lauren. Did you? Yes, uh, I think uh, JJ's salary should be doubled. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, serious note, I just want to be identified as here today and to formalize my application for the housing authority. Okay. And we've been. Uh, and John you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna contribute to the doubling. Was that? Did I hear that? I'll pitch in right now. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. So, and and just kind of a follow up. Uh, and we had a comment from uh, Mr. Paulson in the audience. Not sure if it got picked up, but um, he talked about uh, raising or doubling John Jesuit's salary, but also that he's formally applying to be on the housing authority. Uh, and and John Jesuit and myself uh, are working with. Uh, the director and that that organization on that process so that's in the works okay and so where's the money coming from the, from the oh no account? i didn't mean that process that was i felt um something that well we're getting his bank account action. but we don't want to yeah. you know say that on sure on the record but no the process of getting uh, appointees to the um to the to the housing authority right. that's what we're working on john and i are not working on doubling his salary oh yeah that would take board direction and you can't right. give direction at a work session. So. No, we can't. So with that said, we will adjourn this workshop. It's 1215. Thank you for okay. coming. It's 16 now. 16, 16.